I challenge you to start thinking drastically different about wealth and wealth creation. Things that used to make financial sense to invest your money into have now become financially unintelligent to invest or participate in. And so if you're consuming old information or learning from people who have learned from old information, they haven't kept up with the times, they're not innovative in nature, you may be doing yourself a huge disservice. Just because something worked well 10 years ago does not mean it is smart or lucrative to do today. And this is why the wealthy are voracious learners. In a fourth turning, like the one we're in as we speak, inflation, or as some would say, stagflation, and the devaluation of the currency are two cornerstone concerns. Every single one of us are playing various financial and social games. And these games are driven by incentives. Wealth starts in the mind. And without the words and the mental models to properly make sense of money, it will forever elude you, elude you, elude you. What's going on guys? We're gonna be doing a $500 giveaway. Watch until the end of this video. After you've watched the video, drop a meaningful comment and we will be randomly selecting one comment as the winner. The winner will be announced one week from the day this video drops. So next Monday, we will randomly choose a comment, comment on it, ask you for your email so that we can send you your $500 reward. We wholeheartedly appreciate each and every one of your continued support on our channel and our podcast. And that is why we like to do giveaways like this to give back to you guys. Wish you the best of luck, peace and love. So many of us are on this planet desperately searching for freedom. For many, it feels like it's out of one's grasp. And so we barely even try anymore. People are tired, tired of being lied to, manipulated, tricked, taken advantage of. It's so easy in 2024 to feel like a victim of oppression, a victim of the system. And yet an alternate reality exists where you are not a victim of the system at all. A reality exists where you're a sovereign being in all senses of the word who has taken control of one's spiritual and financial energetics, who has upgraded the way in which you relate to systems that benefit from and have an active interest in your confusion and manipulation. Never forget that the very systems that you may feel stuck inside of are in fact voluntary and they rely on your consent and coercion to continue to operate. You change the world by first changing your own world. And that starts with where you're voting with your dollars. We are going to systematically peel back the curtain on the entire financial advisor and wealth management industry and equip you with a ridiculously high level of financial literacy so that you can walk away from this video making more empowered decisions when it comes to not only your money, but your family's financial future. It doesn't matter if you have 5K in savings or 5 million in savings. Wealth starts with the words and thoughts, which are two of the most invaluable aspects of what it means to have financial literacy. And that, my friends, is my intention today. And for those of you with families, this would be a great video to watch as a family and even discuss key concepts from with your kids. I've done my best to break this down in very simple ways and even give helpful analogies that everyone can follow. Before we get into it, this video is gonna be structured in three parts. 
First, we're gonna lay out some general foundations, facts, and statistics, so we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna explore some of the lesser known conflicts of interest that are at play when you're working with a financial advisor or letting someone manage your wealth. And lastly, I'm gonna share with you all how I personally approach things, which I've never fully done before, how we teach our students to approach things, and what this alternative reality could look like for you if you so choose to take control of your own wealth management and financial sovereignty. Every single section in this video is going to build on the ones laid out prior. So make sure to stick with me until the end so that you receive all of the value that we've managed to pack into this one training. I put an immense amount of time, research, effort, and bandwidth into this, and I'm so honored to share it with you guys. Now, the industry that we're going to be talking about today is one of the most powerful industries in the entire world, many times larger than even big pharma. As a matter of fact, at the time of me filming this video, over $62 trillion in total assets under management are currently circulating in the financial advisory industry. And for perspective, that's almost three times the entire GDP of America in 2023. A number that large is worth paying attention to and understanding at a deeper level rather than sticking your head in the sand like most people tend to do when it comes to financial matters. The financial services industry is fundamentally what we would call an intermediary industry, meaning that most of the companies, products, and services offered connect two sides of a transaction. For example, a buyer and a seller. By existing as the link in between these two parties in a transaction, a financial services product is then able to earn a small percentage of that in transaction fees. This is crucial to understand foundationally about the industry because whether you're dealing with a stock brokerage, a bank, a real estate agent, a life insurance broker, a credit card company, whatever it may be, when their product appears to be free, that's a telltale sign that you, my friend, are the product meaning they are making money off of you in some way on the back end. The same way that social media appears to be free, but is only free because you are the product, i.e. advertisers pay the platforms to be able to advertise to you. Please understand that when it comes to the economy, there are no free lunches. Now that we've established that, let's give some quick examples here so I can make sure you're following me in regards to this concept of intermediary business models. For some financial services, like stock brokerages or credit card companies, they're being paid a small percentage of every transaction that you make, which ends up adding up to billions of dollars a year in revenue for said companies. And yes, even 0% credit cards, or if you pay off your credit cards monthly, these companies are still making profit on you per transaction. That is their business model. Now, for other services like banks, they make their money off of holding your money, then turning around and loaning 10 times the quantity of what you've deposited legally out at, let's say, five times the interest rate that you're being given in your savings account. This is what's called fractional reserve banking, and this is part of the Ponzi scheme that is enabled by a fiat currency and the Federal Reserve central banking system that we have here in America. For financial services like real estate, agents might be making a percentage of closing costs or sale costs. It technically doesn't come out of your pocket directly, but they're still getting paid off of you. And then last but not least, for financial advisors and wealth managers, they make their money by charging a small percentage of total assets under management, AUM. Remember that throughout this video because we're gonna be coming back to this. When you shop across the space, you're gonna find two main financial advisor compensation models. The first model is what's referred to as commission-based. 
This is where you're being sold a financial product that the advisor makes money off of selling to you. Examples of this are mutual funds, life insurance, homeowners insurance, annuities, and so on. And then the second model is what's referred to as fee-based. And this is where your advisor gets paid a percentage of your assets under management, regardless of their performance. Now, the industry standard fee is 1% of assets under management per year, which doesn't sound too bad at first glance. 1%, it's negligible. Going back to the first compensation model, hopefully I don't need to even address the conflict of interest present with the commission-based model, as you're now in a situation where someone is incentivized to sell you something that you don't necessarily need because it might benefit them. For context, this is the same incentivization model as a car salesman. For the purposes of this video, we're going to focus mainly on the most common wealth advisor structure, which is gonna be the fee-based approach. So let's quickly revisit the model. With the fee-based approach, we're looking at an industry average of 1% of assets under management in annual costs, regardless of performance. So let's go ahead and run some quick numbers so that we're on the same page. Let's say you give your advisor a million dollars to begin managing. That's your life savings. You're gonna end up paying $10,000 a year in management fees, regardless of his or her performance. Now, this gets even crazier when we look at the actual average returns of the whole financial advisor industry as a whole, which is imperative to do because 10K a year would be a small price to pay for let's say $250,000 in profit, right? Cost is always relative. So according to Fidelity, one of the largest wealth advisory firms in the world, they currently manage $5 trillion in global wealth for perspective. They estimate their clients can expect to see a, are you ready? 5.1% annualized return on investment. Yet even the most entry level index of the stock market, which houses 500 companies across the entire US stock market, commonly known as the S&P 500, you might have heard of it before, has seen an annualized return of 10.62% over the last 100 years, or if we look back just to the last 10 years, it's seen a 15.3% annualized return, just to give you some perspective. So, in other words, you have this behemoth of an industry that manages tens of trillions in global wealth per year that can't even beat the performance of the S&P 500. And to be clear, this is not gonna be an S&P 500 propaganda video. The S&P is not something I even advocate for or invest in personally. I find it to be an extremely antiquated wealth creation vehicle. That's just me personally. It's a great vehicle to invest in for those without financial literacy who aren't willing to put in the time and effort to develop any semblance of an edge as an investor. But if your goal is wealth creation, like wealth creation, a compounding average return of about 10% a year when inflation eats up more than half of that annually before taxes is light years away from an effective strategy. If you're watching this video right now and you potentially come from a more traditional background when it comes to money management and what is smart to do with your money, I challenge you to start thinking drastically different about wealth and wealth creation. The world has changed so immensely that what was a solid investment strategy even a decade ago is no longer even remotely relevant or competitive anymore. Single digit returns, even low double digit returns should not even turn your head. And what's interesting is most of society 
only views inflation from a consumer lens, AKA how gas, groceries, goods, services cost more now when you wanna buy things. Imagine that, most people are consumer minded. A very small percentage of the population ever gives thought to the wealth creation implications of inflation, which are what I am most concerned with and what I'm trying to teach you here. Avocados costing 1.5 times what they used to, or gas being ridiculously expensive in California, really doesn't matter to me. Because I can just go make more money to more than offset that. And I do. What I am more concerned with is as an investor and an entrepreneur, the inflation rates that redistribute the risk reward of any given investment vehicle, growth rate, or asset allocation. Said more simply, things that used to make financial sense to invest your money into have now become financially unintelligent to invest or participate in. And so if you're consuming old information or learning from people who have learned from old information, they haven't kept up with the times, they're not innovative in nature, you may be doing yourself a huge disservice. And for the record, this is just the nature of economies, humans, and innovation. Things evolve, things change. Nothing lasts forever, especially investment approaches. Just because something worked well 10 years ago does not mean it is smart or lucrative to do today. And this is why the wealthy are voracious learners. In a fourth turning, like the one we're in as we speak, inflation, or as some would say, stagflation, and the devaluation of the currency are two cornerstone concerns. And this changes what is called risk appetite in the markets, which you also might want to write down. It's a key financial term. Investments that may have been attractive at 8% a year before are no longer attractive to global liquidity because inflation the last few years essentially cancels out the net returns of various investments. So think of it as inflation gives context for what a good investment is or isn't in any given time period in the economy. And so if we were in a zero to 2% inflationary economic climate, I could see a case where some of you could argue that a 5.1% extremely low risk ROI annually with your investment advisor is a solid investment. I could see that. For those of you that are older, you're risk averse, you've lost a bunch of money before or whatever. But that is far from the world that we live in today, my friends. For at least the rest of this decade, if not the next decade, we're going to see elevated inflation, the devaluation and decline of the United States dollar, which by the way, means that things are going to get more expensive because buying power is reduced. We're gonna see higher than normal volatility in markets. We're gonna see political division. We're gonna see polarity, social unrest, peak wealth inequality, and so on. And these are all characteristics of a fourth turning, by the way, which I've been talking about publicly for literally years now. This is not the first nor the last time that this will happen. This very cycle has been playing out for thousands of years, actually. But because most of society doesn't actually study real economic history, they're, for all intents and purposes, chicken little and the sky is falling. But I digress. So when we have this kind of macroeconomic backdrop, you have to be able to evolve and keep up with the times. Many, like my parents, are still using investment approaches that were reasonably suited for the 80s, the 90s, maybe even the 2000s, when the population growth and thus GDP growth, those two are always connected, was massively outpacing inflationary pressures. But then, the world changed. After the great financial crisis, GFC, in 2008, those with high levels of financial literacy 
completely rewrote their playbooks and started investing in traditional higher risk assets that notably outperform inflation. And this has caused the definition of what is considered to be risky to be revalued a bit and looked at differently. Value investing, mutual funds, bonds, and other forms of low risk investing, low risk, are largely a strategy to not lose money from inflation, but you're not really gaining any net wealth either. So let me ask you, what is more risky? Continuing to invest into something that can at best slightly outpace inflation or finding the next asset classes that are this generation's real estate boom that the silent generation, Generation X and the baby boomers got to enjoy and then reframing what risk actually is in your mind. So we're starting to make some progress now and we're almost into the good stuff. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about incentives and how they drive behavior, because that is one of the most crucial threads of this entire conversation, and I do not see it talked about enough. If we are to understand why we haven't seen more positive innovation in the financial system, which is literally what I study for a living, we have to talk about incentives. Incentives drive behavior. Now, if I know you guys, like I think I do, many of you watching this are likely not happy with our political, monetary, education, food, and legal systems. Yet these systems continue operating the same way that they always have, despite record levels of public dissatisfaction and public mistrust in them. Do you know why that is? You might say money, corruption, greed. It's actually because incentives drive behavior and incentives have not changed. You might want to write that down. Incentives drive behavior and incentives have not changed. You cannot truthfully call a system broken when it works exactly how it's intended to. The same way that a lawyer who you pay a monthly retainer to has zero incentive to expedite the solving of that case or to even actually win your court case because the incentivization is not baked in to where there's any additional upside for your lawyer if they win since they're just being paid on monthly retainer the same way that a car salesman has an incentive to sell you something that you don't actually need because the degree to which they feed their family is directly linked to how much they can influence you to spend at their dealership. The incentives that reward or punish how your money is invested are no different. When the pay structure of an industry says, we get paid a percentage of your money managed, whether or not we outperform, this is a telltale sign you're dealing with a tentacle of the matrix. And it's not that your financial advisor is necessarily a bad person. He or she likely isn't. I want to be very clear here because I know my people. It is intellectually lazy to demonize or personally attack a given person rather than to dissect the actual complex system that they operate in as every single one of us are playing various financial and social games. And these games are driven by incentives. Many financial advisors, for example, are just finance bros with a bachelor's degree in business and a concentration in finance who put in the 60 hour work weeks initially required to work their way up in an extremely competitive industry so that eventually they could manage a hundred plus accounts and make an amazing living by giving people unknowingly outdated and underperforming investment advice. The financial services space, much like the state, seems to 
fight more to preserve tradition than it invests into getting closer to the truth, whatever that might look like. Now, we're going to explore what is commonly referred to as groupthink bias. Some of you may be familiar with what groupthink is. And this one also directly relates to the extremely robotic, monolithic approach to equities investing that has been industry standard in the wealth management space since before I was alive. In my opinion, the example I'm about to give you is one of the best examples of groupthink bias I've ever seen. It's textbook, no pun intended. And it goes a little something like this. Every finance and macroeconomic bro has been taught the same formulas, the same algorithms, the same indicators to use and to look at in order to determine what to invest in. And just to clarify, I can speak on this firsthand because I literally went to college and got my bachelor's in business administration and for a while was pursuing a finance concentration because I thought I wanted to do this. I took a number of microeconomic, macroeconomic, and finance classes during this time. And let me tell you, we were all taught from the same few dozen textbooks, which have the same few dozen formulas, that each unconsciously entrain you that there is only one right answer given a situation. Then, when these finance grads enter the workforce, they are further indoctrinated to think inside of this tiny little box. They're shown the proper way to diversify and hedge risk. They're shown what success looks like and here are the strategies to mimic and here are the strategies to avoid. They're even shown how to allocate a portfolio for differing degrees of risk tolerance. There are a million unconscious suggestions and little incentive systems that reward singular right or wrong decision making and very, very, very minimal incentives for creativity, out of the box thinking or innovation in this particular industry. It's just one of those industries, but there's one big problem with this. The equities markets, are a zero sum game. And by definition, a zero sum game is a game in which there is one clear winner and one clear loser. And this is important because not all games are zero sum, but the equities markets are truly binary in nature. When you sell a stock, there has to be a buyer on the other side of that transaction, or you won't be able to close out of your position. It will just say open order bid not filled and vice versa. So where I'm going with this, and it honestly astounds me that no one talks about this. When you're playing a zero sum game, the contrarian by default tends to have a mathematical advantage over the herd in terms of upside potential. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they will win more in a quantity sense. They often won't win more in a quantity sense, but from a risk reward perspective, the odds are massively skewed towards the quality of their wins being far more advantageous to the upside. Now, this is assuming as long as one can manage to mitigate the downside risks associated with being a contrarian and develop strategies around this to where even if you take far less rolls of the dice as everyone else, your total upside should be immeasurably higher than those that are content with rolling ones and twos consistently. It should not be hard to see how if you're betting on the same horse as everyone else, your winnings are going to be subpar because they're split between all of you. Or if you're going into business in a given industry that is the most crowded industry and has the most competition, your returns are likely going to be subpar in that industry as you don't have any real advantage over your oversaturated market. 
And if we can understand that the equities markets are a zero sum financial game with one winner and one loser in any given transaction, then you should be able to understand that in order to win at that game, we have to beat out others in not only our strategy, but our thought process, our market timing, and our asset allocation. And yet, we have an entire industry that drinks the same Kool-Aid, they invest based on the same investment pricing models, they consume the same research reports, they go off of the same analyst predictions, and they use the same outdated and inherently limiting finance equations and allocation models to determine the risk management. And thus, a financial advisor has no real alpha. As we transition towards the end of today's episode, I would be remiss if I didn't spend some real time addressing proactive solutions and alternatives to traditional wealth management for you. I know most of you guys probably don't resonate with using a financial advisor or participating in the systems, but that's not necessarily the answer either because you're just going to remain in poverty as your money and wealth is stolen from you over time. I also want to address how I personally go about playing the financial video game in the matrix, but not of the matrix, and a little bit about how we teach our students to navigate the public markets as well. So first things first, there is no right or wrong way to go about things. I'm just going to share a little bit about what has worked for me, as well as our students. Today's video was not created to shame anyone who may not currently be investing or who may still be following outdated approaches that need a tune-up. One of the most important tactical takeaways to walk away from this video with is an understanding of inflation adjusted return as without that understanding the financial gains that you might think you've had are not in fact accurate you might think you've gained some sizable net worth as your home value has gone up since 2020 or your portfolio has gone up 30 percent in the last few years but without running the calculations on how much inflation was present during that time period you aren't getting a clear picture of your actual wealth creation. Today's training primarily focused on what I often refer to as the velocity of money, also known as the second wealth lever out of the three wealth levers that our brand and teachings are rooted in. You might want to write this down. Velocity of money is concerned with the rate or speed at which your money multiplies itself without your time being directly involved or exchanged to do so. This lever is absolutely imperative to master because out of the three levers, cash flow, velocity of money, and tax liability, it is the one financial lever that will free you up from trading your time for money and actually will allow you to buy back more of your free time just like I've done in my own life. The most important question you can be asking yourself if you desire to gain clarity on the velocity of any given investment vehicle or wealth plan that you might be using or considering is as follows. If you want to write this down, I would highly recommend. How long will it take me to double my money inside of this investment vehicle? Now, Unfortunately, a 5% return that your financial advisor averages is going to take you 14.4 years to double. And the best part, that's pre-tax. 14.4 years to turn 100K into 200K or to turn a million into 2 million pre-tax. Now that's not counting the fees that they would charge you annually. And what I'm describing is 
one of the larger systemic problems in the world right now. As you can no longer reach financial independence or financial freedom off of middle class or average investing. Inflation has done away with that. You also can't just buy a home, think it's an asset, get rich off the government debasing your currency while you think you're some real estate genius anymore. We're too late in the macro cycle that I'm always talking about. Real estate asset valuations are far too high and they will only continue to inflate as the US currency is further debased. The generational wealth real estate opportunity died in my parents' generation. If we were in a first turning or a second turning, the financial video game would be on easy mode. But by the time we get to the last 20 to 30 years of 120 year macro cycle, also known as the fourth turning, you could think of it as the fourth quarter, the financial game is now on hard mode and most just aren't prepared. Think about it. What sense does it make that some 31 year old dude on the internet with zero traditional finance experience is outperforming Wall Street or real estate buffs with decades more experience than me and far more traditional investment left brain education than me. This is only possible because I recognize that you can run the best play in the world, but if you run it against the wrong defensive formation, that play is not going to work out well for you. To use a football analogy, Historic economic trends, macroeconomics, and demographic trends are kind of like your opponent's defense when you line up to hike the ball. You have to read the defense to decide what plays to run on the offense and whether or not you need to call an audible at the line, right? That's part of what a quarterback does. Now, many quarterbacks, investors, have been caught off guard because they're running the same plays that won them the last six Super Bowls. Yet they aren't noticing that the defense is consistently lining up in totally new formations that the quarterback has never seen before. The quarterback doesn't recognize these defensive formations as he's never studied tape on them or played against the team who's ever ran them. So he doesn't know what to do. So he just sticks to his guns and continues to run the same plays that won him the last six Super Bowls. This is the difference between those who have studied hundreds of years back of economic and demographic history and those who haven't. Once again, I am only 31 years old. And if I solely used what has happened in my lifetime or even my parents' lifetime to make my investment decisions or to form my economic beliefs and overall thesis, I would be vastly limited in my understanding of economic cycles, how systems change, and most importantly, what investments work well when. While I will choose not to make any specific financial claims because none of this is financial advice, I can tell you that our semi-passive investment methodologies theoretically average around a 50% ROI annually. And some years that looks more like a 25% or even sitting in cash if we're in a recession. And then other years that looks closer to uh, 300% like this year should play out for many of our students. I cannot control the markets, but what I have done is exactly what I described earlier in the video, because I think about this stuff a ridiculous, unbelievable amount. Inside of the LUC, we've developed a consistent investing methodology that focuses on asymmetric risk reward investments, where we are the contrarian investor who may only take five to 10 investments a year. Remember what I said about rolling the dice. 
less rolls, rolling for higher numbers with calculated hedging and risk mitigation. But those investments are demographic trend-based and or secular trend-based opportunities that absolutely destroy the ROIs of those who dollar cost average, index invest, invest in IRAs, invest in real estate, invest in life insurance, or work with wealth managers. And this is not the case because I'm some genius. I'm not. I just think outside of the box and I'm not afraid to do things differently. You don't need a fancy business degree like I have to understand finance or investing. I don't even use my business degree. Ironically, coming into learning these types of things with less existing financial programming is actually more advantageous as you have less to unlearn because the majority of this journey is unlearning. So as promised in the beginning of this video, I'm gonna share a little bit on how I navigate the financial markets in a way that allows me to absolutely destroy hedge funds, wealth managers, and investors while maintaining my autonomy and full control over my wealth and time. For context, I am the sole wealth manager for our family, and I have single-handedly grown my personal net worth from $50,000 in debt, you know, at uh, 23 or so, to multi-multi-millions liquid in less than a decade. And while that's reasonably impressive, what is more impressive is that I'm not a trader and my approaches rely on compounding over time to really demonstrate their true value. I'm only 31 years old at the time I'm filming this. By age 35, our financial reality is going to be yet again unrecognizable to where we are currently, which is kind of baffling to think about. But I mean, that's the whole point of investing, isn't it? I think a lot of people have forgotten what the point in investing is. It's not to live an average mediocre life or settle for 5.1% returns. That shouldn't even get you out of bed in the morning. That's disrespectful. And while I have tried everything from options, commodities investing, crypto, tech and growth investing, dividend investing, value investing, I ultimately landed on a hybrid investment approach that achieves what we call in the investing world confluence between where I believe we are macroeconomically in a fourth turning, as well as what we're going through in terms of demographic shifts, workforce shifts, and secular trends that are driven by innovation and declining birth rates to come up with a very simple framework that allows me to take less than a dozen investments a year tops. I personally create my own asset allocation, which is comprised of a mixture of growth and disruptive innovation companies, cryptocurrency, precious metals, and cash. Yes, cash is a position. Even while the United States dollar is being debased, cash is absolutely a position. We do this custom for our LUC students as well so that they can learn how to become their own money manager. While most who come to us were on pace to retire at, let's say, age 65 if they're lucky, we take that and we can usually condense that retirement, shave decades off of that and get them on a trajectory on our LUC roadmap to retire in a decade or less. We teach them how to invest, what to invest in and the core investor skill sets to become skilled enough to truly be their own wealth manager. They learn how to structure their own asset allocation based on their own goals, their own risk tolerance, and so many other factors. And yet, more important than all of that combined, they learn how to think about money, what to do with it, and how to multiply and protect it so that they never need to rely on me or anyone else ever again to make empowered financial decisions. That's how we got into this mess. 
We don't have sovereignty over our financial futures. We've outsourced and given away our power. It's taken me close to a decade to become skilled enough to be able to put my brain into a framework and duplicate myself to the point that we now have a system that we coined the LUC Financial Freedom Blueprint, where each student who comes into the community is given an incredibly thorough financial roadmap that reverse engineers their next three years, 36 months of their wealth journey and breaks everything down into bite-sized six month semesters that outlines exactly what they should focus on and in what order. Across our brand's product suite, we have the Aligned Entrepreneur, the Level Up Collective, and Self-Trust Academy. We have built out an industry disrupting financial education company that has solved for all three financial levers, cash flow, velocity of money, and tax liability. And I have a hunch that some of you who watch our content regularly still don't understand the gravity of what we have managed to put together and solve for. It's genuinely my life's work. I've dedicated the next decade of my life to actualize this and now scale the system that we've created, helping so many families break away from traditional finance, a multi-trillion dollar industry, and learn how to invest in innovative and fresh ways that are not overly complicated. Some of this may sound complicated, it is not complicated, but in ways that also align with one's values is absolutely priceless to me. More important than making money is how you make your money. Our students on average, I would say, buy and hold between six and 12 assets a year. And they may hold those for anywhere between 12 months and three to five years, depending on a variety of factors. I mean, macroeconomics, where we're at in a given secular cycle, uh, their risk tolerance, their age and the season of life that they're in, uh, their existing cash flow, and so on. The actual clicking of the buttons only takes a few minutes total, which is beyond negligible. The rest of the time is spent learning how to hold wealth energetically, legally, and financially and becoming the person that they need to be so that when the millions come into their life, because they will come into their life, they don't self-sabotage, which is insanely common. Unlike traditional finance, we focus an unbelievable amount of bandwidth and resources on educating our students. Our private LUC curriculum houses more than 300 hours of private education centered around all areas of financial literacy, wealth, freedom, and self-actualization, because that is the real point. Money is just a tool, but it is a valuable tool and it is a tool worth mastering. For if you don't, it will be your master and you will be its slave. By the time you've been in our ecosystem for a year or two, your brain's operating system has successfully been unprogrammed and reprogrammed when it comes to money, credit, investing, wealth management, debt, risk, capital allocation, taxes, law, and most importantly, what is possible for you and your family. We are on a mission, if you can't tell, <laughs> to consciously reform the financial services and financial education space. And we are just getting started. If you would like more information on the Level Up Collective Wealth Mastermind discussed in today's video, 
you can check out the link shown on the screen or in our description or go to www.jgriff.org slash L-U-C. And as always, I hope today's video was immensely valuable for you and that you take the time to rewatch any key areas that you need to take notes on. We dropped a lot of gems in this video so that you can further apply these concepts in your life. I'm going to leave you with this. Wealth starts in the mind and without the words and the mental models to properly make sense of money, it will forever elude you. Until next time, my friend, peace and love.